not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. How many is thankful for salvation today? Amen. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For John bore witness about Him, and he cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. For from Him, from His fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known to us. Jesus has made God the Father known to us, church. And because Jesus came, we can rejoice in knowing that we are reconciled back to our Father. Amen. So I ask you the question this morning, why did Jesus become a man and come to earth? I think I've already given you the answer. Amen. Hold that thought. Amen. And bow your heads with me. Father, I just come to you one more time. I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you for the joy that is in our hearts to receive your word. Lord, let the body of Christ be encouraged and challenged in their walk with you. Lord, to just experience you in a fresh and new way as they leave this place that their lives would never be the same. But you would just undo us from the inside out, Lord. Just, just do that thing that only you can do through the power of the Holy Spirit. For we have come to feast at your table this morning and hear the bread of life broken. Minister to your people. Humble us in your presence, God. Let our ears be open so we can hear. And our hearts be stirred. In Jesus' name. The church said, Amen. 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 So, why did Jesus come to earth? That is the question of the day. You've ever, if you ever are interested in finding out about the goodness of God, how many's ever questioned God? Are you there? Are you good? Are you just mad at me? Are you just having a bad day? What is it, Lord? If that's ever been you, go to the Book of John, and then go to the Little Johns um, in the New Testament, and you can just just soak yourself in the goodness of God. Why did Jesus come, become a man, and come to earth? Here's a few reasons. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but I just want to make a point this morning. He came to reveal the Father yes. to you and me. And I want to prioritize that this morning because if I've struggled in that relationship, then someone in this room has struggled. And knowing your identity. Your identity is found in Jesus Christ. If you're a born again believer. If you're not a born again believer. I have good news for you. You can receive Jesus in your heart today. And then your life too. Will be identified in Christ. And it's vitally important. I don't know if you ever. Some of you grew up in the church. And somewhere the message gets lost. Or if you were raised as an orphan. But Jesus came for one and all. He came for the whosoever wills. And he wants us to know where we belong today. He wants us to know that God our Father is the source of it all. He is a faithful God. And he is fighting our battles. And he goes before us. And he leads and guides us. But he wants more than anything our heart. He wants our heart today because he's a jealous God. He's jealous over us. And why wouldn't he be? He paid the ultimate price so that we could belong and be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. So Jesus came to reveal the Father to humanity. One thing he came to do was to atone for our sins. We
We could not save ourselves. Can I get a witness? 1 John chapter 2 says He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. So you don't have to be the answer to someone's life. You just need to present Jesus to someone because He is the answer for the sin crisis in this world today. He was the answer then. He's the answer now. Jesus came to atone for our sins, church. He came to take upon Himself our punishment, number two, the punishment we deserved. And then He decided He chose to give us what only He deserved. And that's eternal life. So Jesus came that we might receive eternal life. He took our sins upon Him. He took the punishment and the chastisement. He bore all the hatred. How many has ever been rejected in this room? Jesus bore all of that and then some. So that you and I in exchange, we could have eternal life. Romans 5, verse number 6 through 11 says, You see, just at the right time, when we were still yet powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His love for us in this. And then there's a colon. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? You're worried about being saved from your earthly enemy. But what we had to do is be, be saved from the wrath of God. We deserved death because of sin. Through one man, Adam, entered the world. Jesus came to abolish the effects of sin. And he took our punishment. So we might be saved from the wrath of God. For if while we were yet God's enemies, we were reconciled to him. Through the death of his son. How much more? Having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Yeah. Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. through whom we have now received reconciliation. Reconciliation to whom? To God our Father. The third reason I put down he came was to destroy the works of the evil one. First John chapter 3 and 8 says, The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So I tell you this morning, if you identify yourself in Christ, and you've been born again through the power of His salvation, the works of the enemy have, do not have to have an effect on your life. Because Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. Thank you, Jesus. He came, number four, to make an open display of the foolishness of the cross. In Colossians 2, verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. How many knows when he was now to the cross, Satan and all of his finite qualities thought he had won. I got him this time. But my God outsmarted Satan once again. And Jesus made a public display of the enemy. Number five, he came to give us abundant life. And everyone should know this scripture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said in John 10, 10, I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. How many would like to just have full life? Just overflowing life every day. There's hope for us in this place. To initiate present tense, number six. Awareness to initiate present tense awareness of the kingdom of God. How many remembers when Jesus was demonstrating prayer in the garden in, uh, before his disciples? And he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That should be our daily heart's desire, our daily prayers, that the kingdom of God would come and establish here on this earth through his church. Right. We are the vehicle.
people. We are the voice like John the Baptist that cried before Jesus came. We are it, church. The voice crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare for the coming of the Lord. If we don't have a sense of awareness of the times that we are living, how are those who are lost or blinded by sin going to have unaware? How are they going to be awakened? If the church is sleeping, how are they going to be awakened? We can live with an awareness of what God is doing in these day, this day and time. And number seven, to save men's lives, not to destroy them. How many remembers in the psalm, sometimes David, one minute he was just asking God to protect him from his enemies, and then he began to say, God, just kill them all. Yeah. Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. Yeah. Luke 2, 11, he says, the angel said, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. So Jesus came to a planet of orphans. This is how Pastor Bill Johnson puts it. Of Bethel. To reveal what we needed most. If I asked you the question in this room today. What do you need most? There would probably be a bunch of answers. Right? Maybe some various answers. Some of you need. You're just hungry. And you just need food on your table. Some of you need gas. So that you can go to work this week. Or somebody needs money to pay their bills this week. Some of you need a physical healing, right? Some of you need a, a spiritual healing or a family breakthrough. Somebody needs something in this room. But if I ask you the question, what do you need the most? The answer that I brought to you today is you need the Father. You need the Father. This is what has been on my heart. And I, I just, my daughter asked me, she's like, Mom, don't you need to study? What are you going to do? And I said, Honey, I believe in showing up for my assignments. That's my part. And so I've been meditating on the word as much as I could this week while changing diapers and doing laundry and chasing my grandbabies around. And you, you'd be amazed at how you can just see God's love all around you in laundry and in washing dishes. I mean, it's just amazing. And it's just what I do. I just show up for my assignments. Isn't that what we do? All the moms and grandmoms? Yes. And the dads. Can't leave you guys out. And grandpas. We just show up for whatever the assignment is. We don't live in a bubble. Who's living in a bubble in this room? We're all coming to pop your bubble. Bring you some more responsibility. We want to, we're in this together. And y'all know Sister Farmer around here. She didn't raise a lazy daughter. So she was telling me last night we have a little birthday party for my grandson. And it's like, just go out and enjoy it. I said, and I don't think I said it very nice. I'm sorry, Mom. It's like, I cannot. This has to be done before I leave. Do you realize I am going home today, tonight, and I cannot leave this mess. And that's just how I operate. That was my assignment yesterday. And so I just knew. I was like, Lord, you and I have been going back and forth all week. And I just, I just, do, I'm, I just don't have a confirmation yet. I just don't know. And he given me a few signs, like that lady in the grocery store talking about that song. And just some of the things I've been studying lately. And some of my own heart's desire. And I opened up one of my study books and I was like, that's it. What do we all need the most? What do we need the most in our lives? If we could just get that one thing, that one relationship, and be, let it be established every day that we wake up, God, you are the most important relationship in my life. You are Him. You are the one, Lord. There's no one else. There's no one but you, God, that I need more of today. I need you. And if everything around me just goes haywire, and I have you, and I'm standing on the rock, Christ Jesus, and my faith is intact because I have you, Lord, I'm going to be all right. But if everything goes crazy in my life, and I haven't established that, on this day, I'm going to be an all-out mess. And I'm probably going to do things that 
I regret, and I'm probably going to cause more problems for others around me. How many has ever been there? See, we're human. We are flesh. We've got to identify the problem so that we can get the solution to the problem. I want to be a problem solver. I want to be able to say, Lord, come to the Lord and say, this is where I am. And that way when he comes, he can say, daughter, this is what I can do for you. This is who I am. This might be where you are, but this is who I am. And so his I am, when it comes to my need, there's a peace. There's a rest. Amen? Amen. Tragically enough, our view of the Father, our Heavenly Father, is often skewed, it's often, it's often skewed by our experience with our earthly fathers. Many among us in this room, we've suffered abuse or negligence from our fathers here on this earth, or maybe we just come from a broken home. Where the covering or protection or stability of the Father isn't present. So the need for connection to our Heavenly Father might have gotten lost. I've been there. But make no mistake, it's the most important relationship that you and I can even have in our lives. This is the one. This is it. It's the reason, the primary reason that Jesus came. Most of the problems with humanity could be and would be healed with the revelation that Jesus came to set our focus, our attention, and our affection on the Father, who is always good. He is always good. Our Father is always perfect. His love towards us is perfect. And one of my favorite scriptures these last few years, there is no fear in love, for perfect love cast out fear. It drives fear away. When fear comes knocking on your door, if you know who your father is, you don't have to be afraid. You can just send fear on its way. Amen? Perfect love drives out fear. And that's the love that our father has for us today. Even in the Old Testament, Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 says, the Lord is good. A refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust Him. Trust in Him. The Lord is good. He is our refuge. His goodness is seen throughout the Old Testament as He shows mercy. Time and again to a rebellious and a disobedient generation. And often ungrateful people. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. There's that word again. Fear the Lord for those who fear him lack nothing. When you come in reverence before the Lord, you will lack nothing because he will supply your every need, your every desire. That is when you are in right standing with him, your heart is right before him. You know many times I've given people my opinion the Lord's been really dealing with me about this. It's not really my opinion that people need. And I have spent, if I could just add up all the hours that I've been on the telephone or in front of someone, I heard that amen over there coming from the corner. I mean, just my opinion, this is what I think. Well, oh my goodness, we're just, and before you know it, we're every, both parties, we're just so beside ourselves. And an hour has gone, two hours have gone. And then you hang up that phone and you hear that little still small voice. You've been better off just to give them the word. You've been better off just to ask them what I think. Or tell that person, why don't you just go get in the prayer closet. Get into the presence of the Lord. He wants to spend time with you. He's got the answer that you need. You know, it just makes so much sense when we go about it that way. But sometimes we have to do it our way and God will show us years later. He's still the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. When Jesus came, Scripture tells us we beheld His glory. That's what John tells us. The glory of the only, as of the only begotten of the Father. 
In other words, the glory of God was revealed through, to us through Jesus. Both the mystery and the revelation are contained in Jesus. You want to know? Jesus said, if you've seen me, see my Father. So I've got three things I want to share with you. When we see Jesus, we've seen the Father. When you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. If you've not seen Jesus, then you've not seen the Father. When you see Jesus, when you read about these stories in the Word, or when you listen to the testimonies of those around you who have experienced seeing Jesus, and you just you know without a shadow of doubt that was Jesus, then you've seen the Father. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through union with me. I think that's the Passion Translation. No one comes next to the Father except through union with me. To know me is to know my Father too. And from now on, you will realize that you have seen him and experienced him. And Philip spoke up and he said, Lord, show us the Father. Now these are guys that are walking with Jesus in ministry. And they're still doubtful. Lord, show us the Father and then everything will be alright. That's all we'll need. And Jesus replied, Philip, I've been with you all this time and you still don't know who I am. How could you ask me to show you the Father? For anyone who has looked at me has seen the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've got to go through Jesus to get to the Father. So when we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father. When Jesus speaks, number two, it's what the Father is saying. John 12, 49 through 50 says, If you hear my words and you refuse to follow them, I do not judge you. Did anybody ever pick up on this scripture? For I have not come to judge you, but to save you. If you reject me and refuse to follow my words, you already have a judge, he says. The message of truth. Somebody say truth. truth. I have given you will rise up to judge you at the day of judgment. God is bound by truth, church. And we want to blame God and get mad at Him for all these little petty things. When God's Word is truth, truth will judge us because His truth doesn't change. He is a righteous God. He is a holy God. All those beautiful words you declared about Him a little bit earlier, He's magnificent. He is almighty. He is more than enough. He will never change His position. He is truth, and that truth, He is bound by it, will be our judge. For I am not speaking as someone who is self-appointed. Jesus didn't come down here and break ties with the Father. He said, all right, God, I got this. He said, but I speak by authority of the Father Himself who sent me and instructed me what to say. God told me what to say, and I'm saying it. That's how this works. And I know that the Father's commands result in eternal life. And that's why I speak the very words I've heard Him speak. God's words. So when we see Jesus, we've seen the Father. When Jesus speaks, it's what the Father is saying. And number three, Jesus does only what the Father is doing. So why are we doing other things? I only can ask myself this question. Why am I handling life as if I've not been redeemed? Why am I not finding my identity in Christ and letting the resurrected Christ live inside of me and through me and pursuing that relationship with God my Father? Jesus said, you only see what I do is what the Father is doing. You know how Jesus got strong when he was going through times of testing and temptation and human weakness? He spent time with the Father. He didn't spend time with the Father to check off some list and say, all right, God, I gave you 30 minutes today. He spent time with him because that was his desire. We have to ask ourselves, Dad always would preach this and probably hear him coming out of me. The desire of a man. 
that's what we've got to figure out. What's going on in our lives? Have we not prioritized God in our We prioritize everything else, church. We make time for those we love in the sporting events or the movies or the, the, the love of cars, just material things. The shoe shopping. Let's see, what else do I like to do? And the purses. Oh, I know one. We like to get our nails and our hair done. If I could just sit in that chair once a week and let someone fix my hair. Oh, I, do, I never apologize and I never get, I make, when I set up my hair appointment, I set it where I don't have anything else to do because I do not want to be rushed. If it takes her two hours, that's great. If it takes her three hours, that's fine too. Because I enjoy the process of getting my hair done. Now you know something about me. You may not have known. <laughs> now, in all fairness, I probably only do this two, if not three times a year. But it is one of those things. You think of something that you enjoy doing. Now ask yourself the last time that you just enjoyed being in the presence of God. I mean enjoyed. Lord, I just woke up today looking for you. I just want to be with you. Because I know he wants to be with me. He wants to be with you. He said in his word, he said, if you seek me, you'll find me. And Jesus, the only way he could come and be successful in this life and carry out his assignment was because he got power from the Father. He spent time with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. He spent time with him daily in prayer. He would leave the disciples and I've got to go and talk to my father. And he would offer for them to come. Do you know what happened is what happens to me oftentimes. They were so tired they just fell asleep. But they missed out on some great times with the father. And they didn't even realize what they were missing out on until Jesus had already gone back to heaven. Wow. We would have probably done the same thing. Because why? Because we're human. But the more we establish the truth in our lives, that God is my Father. I'm not sure what kind of experience you had with your earthly father, but I can tell you this. By God's design, the Father is the most important person in your life. He says, I was at the beginning, so will I be at the end and everything in between. He is a protector. He is a conqueror. Oh, when we didn't have a plan, God had a plan, a good plan. And he longs to spend time with his kids. His sons and his daughters. And he's probably wondering why you are just getting yourselves all in a mess. And you're trying to do all this stuff on your own. Walking in the old ways. But you're not supposed to be walking in the old ways. We walk in the footsteps of our master. Christ is our master. We are disciples, church. And the disciple has to be disciple just like a child has to be taught. It has to be modeled in front of them. Amen. Jesus said, I'll show you what it looks like. He only did what the Father did and said to do. Jesus said in John 5, 19, I speak to you timeless truth. This truth will not go away. He's like saying, it's not like for, you know, sometimes my grandson will say, but Graham, that's forever. I'll say, how about five minutes? No, that's forever. I'm not talking about that kind of fleeting promise, that kind of fleeting truth. I'm talking about timeless truth, truth that has stood the test of time. It will carry you in this life and in the life to come. Amen? We're going somewhere, church. I heard a beautiful song this morning. I'm telling y'all. I tell Chris, I heard Carrie Job say this one time, welcome to my head. So when I pause and I have this, it's because these thoughts are just coming to my head. And it might be lack of sleep, I'm not sure. But I heard this beautiful song this morning. As I went, this is another confirmation, Liza. 
Don't quit. Amen. Don't quit. Amen. You're almost home. That was the name of it. You're almost home, church. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give in discouragement. Don't give in to all of the lies from the enemy. Okay, so things are changing. Well, welcome to the real world. Things change. We go through things in this life. We cannot hold on to things and expect things not to change. And if we don't allow the change to come, guess what? It's coming anyhow. And the circumstances are going to create more havoc in our lives. If we do not learn to live with our hands held wide open, God, here I am. My, hand, my hands are held wide open. I'm almost home. I'm not giving up, and you're not giving up this morning. We're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything we love about Jesus is from the Father. God the Father is good. And I want to finish out with Hebrews chapter number one. It tells us that Jesus is an exact representation of the Father. His nature and His person. Throughout our history, God has spoken to our ancestors by prophets in many different ways. How many ever read some of the stories in the Old Testament? That's what he's saying. God has spoken to his people in many different ways. And the revelation he gave them was only a fragment at the time. So what happened was he revealed himself a little bit at a time at a time. A little bit. Revelation would come. Building one truth upon another. But to us, living in these last days, God now speaks to us openly in the language of a son. He speaks to us in the language of Christ where we can understand, church. The appointed heir of everything. For through him God created the panorama of all things in all time. The sun is the dazzling radiance of God's splendor. The exact expression of God's true nature. His mirror image. He holds the universe together and expands it by the mighty power of his spoken word. He accomplished for us the complete cleansing of sins. And then he took his seat on the highest throne at the right hand of the majestic one. Amen. Amen. You should read Hebrews. You want to know who Christ is? Read Hebrews. God has given him splendor. But his splendor is an exact replica of who God is. Isn't that something? Jesus told his disciples, it says, even when it was time for him to go back to the Father. Oh, I'm telling you. We need to tap into it. He said in chapter 14 of John, he said, I will ask the Father to send you another helper. Not a different helper, but another helper. Not one that's going to come down and give you a whole new set of ideas. Mm -mm. Another helper who will be with you. Here's that word again. Forever. The word another here means one that is exactly the same. I want to show you this, how the Trinity works. When we see Jesus, we see the Father. When we see the Holy Spirit, we see Jesus. They are the Trinity. They're three in one. They all share the same character and nature. There is no dispute between them. They're in perfect unity. Isn't that awesome? So what are we saying? What am I telling you this morning? That if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. If the Holy Spirit is living inside of you. Oh my goodness. That is the glory of God. That's the way he talks to us. That's the way he brings us comfort. Jesus reveals to us a father. He's not selfish. He's not abusive. But he's loving and he's patient and he's kind. And the Holy Spirit who now lives on the inside of us reaffirms his beauty and his wonder. The work he is doing in us is all about deepening our connection to the father. Who brings identity. 
dignity and purpose and destiny and awareness of unlimited resources to accomplish our purpose in this life. For me, there's two works of grace. One is salvation. Most important work. You're not going to understand the rest if we don't get it first things first. The second one is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Oh my goodness. Wouldn't you love to just hear that voice? Daughter, no, no. Daughter, I need you to go here. Daughter, I need you to go. Daughter, I need you to show up right here. Wouldn't you love to just be in the right place at the right time? So God can just use you. Guess what? If you awake up every day with a willingness to show up for your assignment, He will put you right where you're supposed to be. He will begin to speak to you and show you things. I'm telling you, we, would, we wouldn't need the preacher if the people of God would get in their prayer closets and just let the power of the Holy Spirit begin to reveal what the Father is wanting to say to us. It's not a magic potion. Jesus didn't come down here and operate in sorcery. No. And what did Jesus say? Greater works will you do. Why? Because I go to the Father. You see how this works? Church, we've been empowered. There's been times when depression has almost taken me out of my mind or sadness or grief. I know that I'm not the only one in this room that has done some spiritual warfare just to keep your sanity sometimes. And nothing your husband will say or your mother will say or your children will say nothing. But I go to my father. I learned this a long time ago. And I want you to know this. If you came into this room today, Mom, well, coming up. You came on into this room today and you don't know this. You need to know this. It's, it's sad if it's been a secret to you. But today's a new day. You can know it today. You can know the love of a father. If you just go and just sit before the Lord and say, all right, God, I don't understand a word that girl said today. But I do know I need to be loved and there's something lacking in my life and I just want to sit at your feet. I promise you He'll meet you there. And you'll begin to develop a relationship that is just so sweet. It'll be like Jesus all over again. Jesus as the Son when He was here on the earth. He would tell the disciples, I just, I gotta get away. I gotta just go talk to the Father about this. And that can be you and me. We just set aside that time and just let Him love on us. Oh, does life need us up, church. When the Holy Spirit is able to do His perfect work in us, our connection to all that is good is strengthened and made clear. The revelation of God our Father is the ultimate expression of the goodness of God. Let me say that one more time. The revelation of God our Father is the ultimate expression of the goodness of God. And I heard an awesome message, and I couldn't tell you who preached it. It was in the last couple of weeks. It might come to me later. About the prodigal son. It's really not a story about the prodigal son at all. If you go back and read Luke 15, the prodigal son's story, I think that's where it's found. It's about the unconditional love of the Father. The, what the Father would do. He went in, in, in um, biblical days, men just, they had a, a certain way they carried themselves. And everything was done proper and in order. And if you got outside of that, that was something wrong with you. But when the son who had went away, took all the inheritance and spent all of it, when the father saw him, before he could even get to the father, the father was already running to him and threw his arms around him. He stripped himself of any kind of royalty or dignity that a father carried in 
that day. It is the story of unconditional love for humanity. Why else would Jesus have shared it with us? He knew that somewhere, sometime down the road, someone was going to be struggling with, I'm not good enough. I've made too many mistakes. My life is a mess. It's too late. But today is the day of salvation. It's not too late. It is never too late. As long as there is breath as you're standing on your feet this morning. As long as you have breath in your lungs. It's not too late to start again. Even if you're a born again believer and you've got relationship troubles. And you can't get along with your spouse or with your family members or with your co-workers. Today is a new day. Christ is the hope of glory. Christ is the Father revealed on this earth. And through the power of His Spirit, church, we have been made new. When are we going to start living in the new life? We don't have to wait. We're almost home. But we don't have to wait to have joy. I, I mean, there has been times these last few years, I'm like, Lord, I don't even know what joy looks like. But I know that you are there. I'm telling you the truth from my heart, church. <laughs> when you sign up to be a child of God, it doesn't exempt you from anything hard in this life. I know people that have gone through far greater things and I wonder how in this world could someone survive that? Lord, what would I ever do if I was in that situation? But I'm telling you just as sure as I'm standing here, I hope He brings me back to the Father. I hope someone comes my way and says, the Father loves you. Everything you need is in Him. Everything you need is found in Him. You'll never find it. I know people that are searching. They've done traded husbands and wives like they trade their change their socks. Is that what they say? We change spouses like we change our socks. There's not a person on this planet that can bring you joy. Joy is a choice. Happiness is a choice. And when we choose Jesus, guess what? Oh. He's got an abundant supply, church. He's got an abundant supply. He's got a supply of it when you're going through grief. He's got a supply when you're going through hard times and struggle and physical pain. I know someone that I, I, I met recently. She said, I live every day in pain. And I'm just like, I don't even know how you do that. But she just gives and pours out of her heart. Why? How does she do that? Well, I really do know how. Because that's what God does. That's what the Father does for us. He fulfills us. He satisfies us. He carries us. Even in the hard times. He doesn't say, you're not going to have hard times. But He says, I am good in the hard times. So as we bow our heads this morning in prayer, I just want to pray over you. If you have a special need in this room, you can come talk to the Lord about it. If you would like special prayer, I'm happy to pray with you. But as we just pray a prayer to dismiss from this service, Lord.